So, uh, my name is Tejas Mehta. I am 1 of the uh, cardiologists down here at grants and today I'm going to be doing a WebEx, uh, talking about heart failure. Uh, some statistics, some presentations, um, some different, uh, etiologies or mechanisms of heart failure. And then we'll go over some of the things that can be done in the field. Uh, by you folks as EMS providers to kind of help us. Um, so. Here we go. So, congestive heart failure is a fairly common problem, as you all are aware. Uh, it affects uh, nearly 7 million people over the age of 20, and this number is expected to increase by nearly 50% over the next 10 years. Um, every year, we have approximately 1 million new cases of heart failure. And of course, uh, this number increases as the population gets older. And you can see here in the statistics. Uh, the age ranges where we have these uh, high numbers of heart failure. So, risk of developing heart failure uh, ranges anywhere between 20 and 50% when you're above 50. Uh, having high blood pressure and coronary artery disease both raise the risk of heart failure. And generally, it is not uh, preferential in terms of gender. It's a one-to-one -one male to female ratio. And generally, the, the diagnosis of heart failure uh, when you get that diagnosis, your five year survival rate is approximately 50%. Um, and of course, uh, because it is such a prevalent issue, it is quite expensive. If you look at the statistics by Medicare, over $30 billion in 2012, and within 10 years is expected to rise to nearly $70 billion spent in treating congestive heart failure. So, post discharge readmission rates are approximately one out of five within three months. And almost 50% occur within six months. And, you know, here at Grant, we do tend to see um, a lot of the same people uh, coming back in due to non compliance or whatever the reason. Um, and then uh, the number of heart failure diagnoses have increased significantly over the last few decades. And as our patients get older and we do a better job keeping them alive, there is uh, a higher incidence of heart failure uh, just because of what we can do with revascularization as well as defibrillators. Even in particular talking about defibrillators, uh, defibrillators do help you live longer by preventing sudden cardiac death by approximately two years. The downside is that people end up dying from heart failure as opposed to sudden cardiac death. So that's one of the trade-offs uh, when you talk about advancing technologies. So here is a little bar graph here talking about heart failure and the cost. So nearly twice as much as uh, uh, cancer uh, and perhaps uh, a little less than half as much as uh, myocardial infarction, but still a pretty expensive uh, medical problem uh, when you talk about uh, congestive heart failure. So we talk about heart failure, you know, uh, sometimes this term does uh, get me a little uh, irritated. Uh, everyone says they have heart failure and it kind of ends up being a, a garbage can diagnosis that if you're short of breath or you have swelling, you have heart failure. Uh, but that always is not the case. Um, but today we're going to talk specifically about true heart failure. And when we talk about that, there are different types of heart failure. There is a low. <laughs> sorry, uh, there is a low output heart failure as well as a high output heart failure. There is systolic versus diastolic. So the difference here is the squeezing function versus the relaxation of the heart. And then when we talk about left ventricle versus right ventricle. And then, of course, acute heart failure versus an exacerbation of chronic heart failure. So here's heart failure, real easy, real simple, right? Of course, there's nothing simple about it. Uh, it's a physiologic state in which the cardiac output is not able to meet the demands of the body. And here is uh, one of these crazy slides where it talks about all the different interactions. And I don't expect anyone to read this or memorize it or understand it all because it is pretty complicated, but that's the whole point. It is a very complex uh, interaction of the heart, of the kidneys, of blood vessels, of lungs, and, and what we're trying to do is just better understand how it happens and then what can we do acutely to make it better. So when we talk about uh, low output heart failure, this is kind of the classic story of systolic heart failure where the heart pump is not strong enough to maintain enough cardiac output to meet the demands of the body. So multiple common causes 
Uh, the classic is coronary artery disease uh, or where you've had a blockage and you have scar tissue and part of the heart is not working right. So that is old heart attack leading to heart dysfunction and we call that an ischemic cardiomyopathy. People can have had a heart attack 20 years ago and the front part of their heart doesn't work because they didn't get good blood flow and it died. So that would be more under the chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy. And of course, there's always the acute STEMI where if you have a blockage to a blood vessel, that blockage doesn't allow blood to get to the heart muscle. And that area of the heart where it didn't get enough blood flow is stunned and it doesn't work right. So you can have heart dysfunction acutely from a STEMI and that can cause congestive heart failure. Uh, another cause is if the valves don't work right. So more of a chronic issue is aortic stenosis. So that aortic valve is the main valve that goes between the left ventricle and your body. And as you get older, it becomes thicker and it becomes more calcified. And as it becomes more calcified, it does not open as well. So aortic stenosis, as you get older, can cause congestive heart failure. Uh, this is something through technology that we're able to fix. Uh, actually percutaneously through a little tube in the groin. Uh, they don't need open heart surgery anymore. Uh, and then another cause is mitral regurgitation. We'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail of mitral regurgitation, but you can have acute mitral regurgitation uh, and then you can have chronic mitral regurgitation and we'll try to show the differences between that and how one may present sicker than the other. And then you can have uh, what we call non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. So this is where the heart function is abnormal, but it is not due to a blockage. Uh, it can be due to a virus. It can be due to chemotherapy. It can be due to stress. Um, but these, this is something that uh, still can also present as heart failure. So high output failure is, is much less common. Uh, this is kind of where the heart is working overtime. Uh, it's working really hard, really fast, uh, and this can occur when you're septic because you kind of get tachycardic and you get vasodilated and the heart just is pumping really fast and it can't maintain that cardiac output. They typically improve with uh, IV fluids and pressors. Uh, anemia, so anemia is when you obviously have a low hemoglobin and you're not able to provide enough oxygen, but that also results in a low blood volume, so then the heart has to beat faster to maintain that cardiac output because the blood volume is so low. And then when your thyroid is super overactive, we call that thyrotoxicosis, they can have thyroid storm where their heart rate, once again, is really fast and their heart is working overtime. But just because everything is going fast doesn't mean it is working efficiently. So those are some kind of high output failure uh, scenarios, uh, once again, not very common, but just still something to be aware of. So when we talk about heart failure, otherwise we talk about systolic versus diastolic. So the simplest way to think about this is where systolic heart failure where is, is where the pump is weak. Uh, so one simple analogy is where there's an old balloon and it's kind of weak and baggy and it can't generally generate enough pumping force or function. Uh, to supply enough blood flow to the body uh, versus diastolic, diastolic heart failure. So this is something different where the squeezing function is normal, but the relaxation part of the heart doesn't work well. So this kind of correlates to a brand new balloon. So whenever you try to inflate a new balloon, it's stiff, it's small, and you have to really generate a lot of force to fill that balloon. So that is what we call diastolic heart failure. So we see this classically in little old ladies who have chronic high blood pressure. So when you have chronic high blood pressure, the heart muscle becomes thick, it becomes stiff. Uh, and then when you uh, actually have a bad rhythm, uh, in particular atrial fibrillation, and I'll, and I'll show that a little bit later, uh, you can develop heart failure due to loss of atrial contraction from atrial fibrillation and they get diastolic congestive heart failure and they can actually get pretty sick uh, when they get tachycardic from AFib. So here's just a little schematic, uh, probably easiest to first understand is the systolic heart dysfunction. So this is basic uh, cardiac anatomy. So the, the right side is over here where the blood comes in from the body through the superior vena cava, drops into the right atrium. This is your tricuspid valve, directs blood down to your right ventricle right ventricle goes out through your pulmonic valve out to your pulmonary arteries. Uh, 
So here through your pulmonary arteries, this is where you would get a pulmonary embolus if that were to happen. Uh, that's just obviously a different topic, but uh, blood goes through the pulmonary artery into the lungs, where in the lungs you get oxygen exchange, and then blood returns back to the left atrium. And then from the left atrium, it actually goes down across the mitral valve here into the left ventricle, and then from the left ventricle goes out to the aorta. So if you have a dilated or dysfunctional left ventricle, so this is that main left ventricular pump, we consider that systolic dysfunction. So if let's say they had a heart attack to this part of the heart, this part of the heart doesn't work right, so you can't squeeze as well, and then you can't push blood out. So that would be once again, kind of classic systolic heart failure. I'll talk more about mitral leakiness later on. Um, and then here is the other version. We talked about this diastolic heart failure or the brand new balloon where you can see the heart muscle here is a little stiff and it has difficulty relaxing. So when we talk about filling of this left ventricle or kind of filling of that brand new stiff balloon, the way the heart works is there is initially an early passive filling of blood. So basically this valve is open, blood pours from the top to the bottom kind of passively. Uh, and then because this is so stiff, that blood fills really fast and the pressure goes up. Uh, and then you get the squeeze of the left atrium. So you get this early passive filling, then you get atrial contraction to then push blood further down into the left ventricle. So what can happen in little old ladies who have hypertension or if they have aortic stenosis and this left ventricle is really thick is that if they develop atrial fibrillation. So if you think about what atrial fibrillation is, Atrial fibrillation is where the top part of the heart, you don't beat normally, kind of quivers. So you lose that atrial contraction. So then basically you are relying on filling the lower chamber or the left ventricle through only that early atrial passive filling and you lose that atrial contraction or that atrial kick. And in some people that atrial contraction or the atrial kick or the normal beat comprises 50 to 60% of their cardiac output. So when you know, grandma goes into atrial fibrillation, goes real fast. She's losing 50 to 60% of the filling of the left ventricle because this left ventricle is so stiff. And then that causes everything to back up and they go into congestive heart failure. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I think I talk about it again. Uh, so here, once again, just to review, uh, causes of heart failure from a systolic pump standpoint, it can be a myocardial infarction. It can be valvular heart disease. It can be hypertension. So I have hypertension listed here twice. If you have high blood pressure initially, it makes the heart walls thick and stiff. But over time, chronically, high blood pressure can cause systolic heart failure because that heart muscle just burns out. It starts out thick walled and stiff, but eventually it can turn weak and baggy. Uh, and then we talked about cardiomyopathy where you can have non ischemic causes or causes not related to blockage that can be chemotherapy that can be virus that can actually be this thing called Takusova's cardiomyopathy, which is a stress induced cardiomyopathy. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. That kind of is one of our favorites here just because uh, it's a common thing over the last 10 to 15 years, but not everyone knows about it. And then when we talk about diastolic dysfunction, that's the filling of the left ventricle that can be related to high blood pressure. The heart muscle gets thick and stiff. As we get older, you get kind of more fibrosis, so you get more stiffness. Uh, people can have what we call infiltrative cardiomyopathies. That's where you get different proteins uh, like amyloid uh, that can infiltrate the heart muscle and create stiffness. And then actually if your pericardium, so pericardium is the sac around your heart. If your pericardium gets calcified or you get uh, pericardial effusion with tamponade, that also impacts cardiac filling and can cause congestive heart failure. So when we talk about acute versus chronic heart failure, acute heart failure or a brand new heart failure without a history of prior heart failure is really a low percentage, uh, probably 15 to 20% of heart failure. Uh, usually these people are pretty sick because it's a brand new problem. This is gonna be your STEMI. This is gonna be your acute mitral regurgitation, which can be from a STEMI or even from a cord popping. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I'll show you a picture later on what I mean by that cord uh, popping. And then uh, the majority, though, of uh, heart failure admissions 
uh, 75 to 80% are just simply exacerbations of chronic heart failure. People have a history of congestive heart failure, and then they just worsen it. Uh, it uh, you know, the most common thing we see is going to be non-compliance. You know, they went and how they went out and had pizza, or they had their potato chips, or Chinese food, or Bob Evans. They didn't realize that they're taking in a high sodium load. Uh, sometimes people don't want to take their diuretic when they're going to run around town because uh, they don't want to get around uh, peeing a lot. Uh, if people get sick, so if people have a virus or they get a cold uh, or pneumonia, that can kind of push them over the edge and they can get an exacerbation of heart failure. But generally, 75 to 80% of heart failure is just an acute on chronic exacerbation. So the important things that, that we do and that I think you guys should be doing is really it's about the clinical diagnosis and the history. So 80% so of this diagnosis can be made just by talking to the patient. So you ask them questions, you know, how, how long have you been feeling bad? Did this happen all of a sudden or has this been creeping on for a couple of weeks? So generally when people are non-compliant with diet and medications, it tends to be kind of an insidious kind of gradual onset. When it's an MI or, or, or a torn cord for mitral valve disease, it's more abrupt. Uh, the big question is, hey, you've been taking your medicines. One of my classic questions whenever I see anybody for heart failure is, what did you eat the last couple of days at home? And you'll, because, you know, most people think they don't eat salt, but then when you ask them what they ate, 90% uh, of what they eat has high sodium. Uh, obviously, if they've had any previous episodes, are there any other constitutional symptoms? Are they, are they having a fever? Um, are they bringing up productive sputum because they may have an upper respiratory infection that may have triggered uh, their exacerbation of heart failure? Uh, when we talk about physical examination, having a murmur uh, is important. Uh, I do believe I have a little picture somewhere here about murmurs. So aortic valve murmur can tell you about aortic stenosis. Typically, aortic valve murmur is going to be at the second intercostal space just to the right of the sternum, the patient's right. Uh, that's where your aortic valve murmur is. Uh, if you have mitral regurgitation, that murmur is going to be more out towards the left uh, axilla or left apex of the heart just below the nipple. Uh, that will be kind of where your classic mitral regurgitation or leaky mitral valve murmur is going to be. Um, obviously, if they have crackles in their lungs, they're gonna, they're, there may be some evidence of that may be a sign of volume overload. If they have lower extremity edema, uh, typically lower extremity edema is going to be more of these chronic heart failure players. Uh, and then JVD or jugular venous distension. Uh, jugular venous distension is generally a sign of increased filling pressures. Um, the hard part is that from left-sided heart failure, is that from a PE, is that from pericardial tamponade, or is that even from a COPD exacerbation? So this is just one part when you're talking about their physical examination that you should be aware of. So acute systolic heart failure, we'll kind of focus on. This is kind of where us uh, interventional cardiologists and cath lab boys uh, get a little uh, more interested. Uh, coronary artery disease or STEMIs, um, they can cause uh, ischemic issues where heart function is not normal, and that can uh, obviously cause heart failure. If people have atrial fibrillation with a rapid rate, that's kind of a classic uh, heart failure issue, can even cause systolic heart failure. I know I talked about diastolic, but can also cause acute issues. Acute valvular dysfunction, and then finally, this octopus pot or uh, Takusobus cardiomyopathy, or also known as broken heart syndrome. We'll spend a little time on that here. So, presentation of acute pulmonary edema, usually it's a sudden increase in the filling pressures of the lungs due to some sort of acute decompensation, decompensation on the left side. So, remember, we had that schematic where we talked about left atrium, left ventricle. Uh, they can have an acute MI causing LV dysfunction. They can have a valvular problem where it creates uh, in, inefficient uh, blood pumping on that left side and then arrhythmia. Uh, usually their signs and symptoms are reflective of low oxygen levels. And when you are, have a low oxygen level, you get that increased sympathetic tone uh, where they are in that fight or flight uh, uh, mode. They're going to be tachycardic. They're going to be tachypnic. Uh, their blood pressure may be high all kind of those things when we're not feeling well and our oxygen levels are low. Uh, once again, talking about acute MIs, acute occlusion of a vessel can cause myocardial stunning, uh, causing heart, fa heart failure. And then it can also cause an acute mechanical issue that leads to uh, heart dysfunction. Uh, so, oh, here's my murmur picture, I apologize. <laughs> 
Uh, so when we talk about you're facing the patient, this is the patient's right, this is the patient's left. Uh, this is generally where you're going to hear an aortic stenosis murmur. It's going to be systolic murmur, uh, and it may radiate to the carotids. Uh, if you have a diastolic murmur here, that would be more aortic insufficiency. Uh, but then here, out towards the apex, even out towards the axilla, if you had bad leakiness of the mitral valve, you would get this blowing holosystolic uh, murmur out here. Uh, if you have a diastolic murmur out here, that generally is mitral stenosis, but that is not typically an acute presentation. Um, but yeah, so this is when we're talking about systolic stuff, aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation. So this is where we'll talk about uh, myocardial infarctions and mitral regurgitation. So once again, here's kind of the same sort of schematic. Blood flow comes down through the right side, goes out to the lungs, from the lungs comes back from the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, left ventricle, out to the body. So if something bad happens here in this left ventricle, meaning heart attack right here, this part doesn't work, that makes heart function abnormal, blood and fluid starts to back up, it backs up into the left atrium, which then backs up into the lungs, and there you get pulmonary edema or heart failure. So heart attack, this area gets stunned, bad things happen. Uh, ignore annular dilatation because this is more of a chronic issue, but you can have a heart attack where, so this is your mitral valve anatomy. So for those of you who don't know, your left atrium is right here. These are your pulmonary veins as they dump blood into the left atrium. Left atrium comes across this mitral valve, mitral valve, uh, the blood flow goes through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, left ventricle goes out to the aortic valve into the aorta. So the way the mitral valve is made is you have these little leaflets or doorways that are tethered to muscles here in the left ventricle. So sometimes people can have a heart attack to the artery supplying this papillary muscle. This papillary muscle dies because of a heart attack, and then this can pop off, and then this acute, acutely, where this papillary muscle tears off, and now you got this flail mitral valve leaflet that is just flapping in the breeze, and people have severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, this is generally a surgical emergency because there's no way for us to really fix this. We can temporize things with a balloon pump, uh, or some sort of LV unloading, but that generally is a uh, surgical emergency. You can actually also have papillary muscle rupture that does not occur uh, in the setting of a heart attack. So people who have myxomatous mitral valves, so myxomatous mitral valves are when valves, uh, probably the easiest way to explain it is normal mitral valves tend to be a little bit more leathery. Uh, myxomatous mitral valves tend to be a little bit more stretchy and rubber bandy. So sometimes they can have that extra stretch and flip in this mitral valve and then these cords also are abnormal and these cords can pop and tear and they can also develop uh, severe mitral regurgitation if a cord ruptures and it's not even related to a heart attack this is an echo image where here's this torn cord kind of if it was moving it would be flailing back and forth and you'd have a ton of mitral regurgitation um, now this is a little different scenario where you've had an old heart attack and this is all scarred down and when this scars down, so let's just say the heart attack initially didn't cause this, and then over time, heart attack causes scar tissue, that pulls this tether down, that allows blood to seek in through here because then this valve leaflet can't close all the way. So this would be more of a chronic mitral regurgitation uh, etiology. So, so it's, it's actually pretty interesting in all different ways. Uh, valve heart disease can create mitral excuse me, can create heart failure and they all have different mechanisms. Uh, and here's just another schematic of how we can tell acute mitral regurgitation versus chronic mitral regurgitation. So here's your normal left ventricle, blood from the lungs into the left atrium, across the mitral valve into the left ventricle, out through the aorta. So, so a little old lady who has an old heart attack and this mitral valve doesn't close all the way because the tether here is fixed and scarred, they have leaky valve over 20 years so over 20 years the leaky valve goes back here and over time this chamber just becomes dilated because you're getting leakiness here as well as blood pouring in from here so this chamber will be dilated and enlarged versus the new person who had a heart attack or who had acute papillary cord rupture they are not used to having a lot of leakiness 
So this left atrium has had has not had time to get big and dilate. So now you have a ton of blood going backwards in a much smaller room that makes the pressure much higher and that then backflows and causes pulmonary edema versus little old grandma over years has developed a dilated left atrium where it has gotten big to compensate and then you do not get the same pulmonary edema. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense and that's the difference between an acute presentation and a chronic presentation. And when I do heart catheterizations, I can put catheters to measure lung pressures and we can see if there is high left atrial pressure versus, versus normal left atrial pressure. And then obviously echocardiogram can help us to decide by the size of the left atrium if it's acute versus more chronic. So arrhythmia. So here, once again, when you, your heart is going fast, uh, that whole filling phase, remember we talked about left ventricular filling occurs from two phases of atrial filling. You get that early passive kind of uh, blood flowing into this lower chamber. And then lastly, you have kind of the, the squeeze of the atrial contraction. So all of this left ventricular filling occurs during diastole. So when you are tachycardic, you are reducing the time available for ventricular filling. So this can make things harder to fill and can also uh, create a lot of work uh, because even during diastole is when you get coronary perfusion. So this is how going tacky can exacerbate heart failure and even exacerbate uh, acute coronary syndrome and myocardial oxygen demand. Most commonly is this atrial fibrillation that we talked about. You lose the atrial contraction uh, you have decreased time to fill the left ventricle, and you ultimately get diastolic dysfunction with congestive heart failure. Bradycardia. Uh, so more than anything, if you have bradycardia, you can get AV disassociation, where you don't get coordination and timing of your atrium to ventricle, and you can lose your atrial kick, which can then cause decreased cardiac output just in a different mechanism. So we'll talk a little bit here about octopus pot. So this is uh, actually a patient of mine. Uh, if you guys have seen my talk before, I, I kind of uh, like to talk about this because I do think it's a it's a really nice example of what it is. So octopus pot, or a, so this is an acute cardiomyopathy related to stress or uh, a broken heart syndrome. So this is a 61 year old female who actually went to Kashakton's ER after she was assaulted by her son. Uh, she was treated for injuries history of stroke, history of diabetes, history of lung disease. They kept her overnight. She had some chest pain, her troponin was positive. And they said, okay, her troponin's positive. We need to make sure she's not having acute coronary syndrome. So one of my partners goes to Kashokton. They called, they called him and she ended up being transferred to Grant. Uh, during her transfer, she became uh, profoundly hypoxic. She went from two liters nasal cannula to requiring a face mask uh, with bilateral rails. Uh, ended up bringing her directly to the cath lab for heart catheterization because with the setting of a positive troponin and acute heart failure, uh, I wanted to make sure that this wasn't a big bad uh, coronary artery blockage. So here is uh, her angiogram. So this is actually her angiogram where uh, I don't know how many people have seen heart catheterizations. Basically, this is my catheter. Uh, I'm going to pause it right here. So that's my catheter. I'm injecting dye into the heart arteries. So if I go back a little, so this is left main, this is circumflex, this is little obtuse marginal, this is left anterior descending artery, uh, this is diagonal. So, so when I do these heart catheterizations, you know, we fill the arteries with dye where it's open, that looks great, where it's narrowed. So you can see it looks like somebody took a little chunk out of her artery. The reality of the situation is the artery still goes right through here, but because of plaque, this is a stenosis. So this is probably about a 50% lesion. Uh, you'll see down here, she's got another lesion. Uh, here is circumflex, she's got some mild disease, but we can tell when people have acute plaque rupture because if this was an acute heart attack, this plaque would not be so nice and smooth. Uh, this kind of has this smooth appearance of plaque that pops, uh, almost looks like there's a little crater and there tends to be blood clot or thrombus there. Uh, 
So, so from doing this heart catheterization, I know that none of these are acute lesions. Uh, so none of these cause a heart attack. Uh, so then we take these pictures and we go around the world. So this is the same left anterior descending artery. So you can see disease here. Disease here, actually in this angle, they don't look nearly as bad. Um, and then the circum, here's your left main, here's your circumflex. So we make sure that there's no significant coronary lesion that would be causing her issue. Here's her right coronary. So dive filling. She has some mild disease right here. If I, I'll freeze it here in a sec. So mild disease right here. You see how it kind of narrows. The black is just because the artery is coming at us and the dye is stacked on itself. There are some mild stuff here, but generally nothing tight, nothing bad, nothing that would be causing her to be so sick. And then here's her left ventricle. So this is uh, 10 years ago where we did everything from the groin. Uh, this is a, what we call a pigtail catheter. This picture, unfortunately, is not uh, so great. Uh, a little time, maybe if it loads up, it'll look a little better. Fortunately, it's not uh, displaying that well. But basically, uh, if I could show it to you, the, the, the front tip and bottom parts of our heart do not work well. They're essentially uh, dyskinetic and not working. So this is this anterior apical and intro apical hypokinesis. And so she ended up getting an intraortic balloon pump. So this right here is the balloon pump that is going into the aorta to help that heart that's working over time. This was 10 years ago before we had impella. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So, so what she ended up having is this thing called Takasova's cardiomyopathy. It has a lot of different names, left ventricular apical ballooning syndrome, ampulla cardiomyopathy, transient left ventricular dysfunction or broken heart syndrome. Uh, and basically what happens here is that you get transient regional wall motion abnormalities. Usually the tip and mid ventricle are not working right and the base is hyperkinetic, first described in Japan. And takusobas is the Japanese term for a pot that captures octopi, not octopus, but you know, captures octopi. Uh, it occurs usually after some major emotional or physical stress. So probably this lady who was physically assaulted uh, had this problem. So here's a kind of a better picture, uh, left ventricle. And you can see here this, the neck of it squeezes, but the mid ventricle apex and base do not squeeze. And this is what your octopus trap or takusoba pot from Japan. So they present with chest pain after some sort of emotional stress. Initial EKG can be anything. You can have ST segment changes. You can have ST elevation. You can have a bundle branch block and it's variable. Uh, this is a New England Journal of Medicine article from probably about 10 or 12 years ago where they did a 19 patient uh, uh, retrospective analysis. And these are all the different triggers that led to takusobas. So mother's death, car accident, surprise party, death, 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 fear of a procedure. Uh, this person ended up getting a balloon pump, uh, uh, an argument, going to court, public speaking. So all sorts of things. And, you know, probably in 15 years here, I've probably had about 30 of these and they all do have some sort of emotional trigger. Um, but, but usually it, it can be something pretty benign, uh, like, uh, having an argument or obviously can be something pretty significant like the death of a loved one. So these are just different EKG. So obviously none of these look normal. Uh, if, if you called me or you guys sent one of these in uh, from the field, I would be worried about acute coronary syndrome, but these are all classic. These are all patients part of this study where they had pretty ugly looking EKGs uh, and they ended up having this Takasopus cardiomyopathy. So the majority of them do have an elevated troponin uh, we're not checking CPK anymore, but they all do have abnormal troponin. Majority of them are female and they tend to be older, 62 to 75. So your classic uh, patient for Takusobos cardiomyopathy is the postmenopausal female. Uh, I actually uh, stented a guy on Tuesday whose wife I had taken care of six years ago for this and she was also postmenopausal female. Uh, typically these people do not have any coronary artery disease that is significant. Um, so that, that is why, you know, you have to say you, these people have to go to the cath lab before you can make this diagnosis, because theoretically they could have a severe LED lesion that wraps around the mid, 
anterior wall, apex and uh, inferior apical wall, and it could be a, a occluded LAD, but that's why they need a heart cath to say it isn't a coronary artery problem first. Uh, a lot of times uh, these people do not need hemodynamic support, but there are people who do need uh, pressors, dobutamine, dopamine, and of course, intruder balloon pumps. Um, I, I will tell you, I've probably put in about five balloon pumps, but I have not put in an impella yet for Takusobas, uh, and typically function will improve within days up to weeks. Um, initial mechanisms, there was a lot of concern if this was inflammation, uh, but ultimately what they found out was that it was just high surges of adrenaline. So they did blood work and other, act and other studies where these people have high levels of catecholamines, and it's basically a trigger of this fight or flight mechanism. They have sympathetic hyperactivity in the apex, and they all have elevated plasma catecholamines, even compared to heart attack patients. Uh, so they think that that's where it comes from. You know, initially there was a favorable long-term prognosis, meaning usually people don't die of this. Uh, we treat them as we would any other heart failure patients, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, diuretics as needed. Uh, there are some new studies though that say once you've had it, there is a 20 to 30% chance that it may reoccur. So, so anybody that I have who I treat for this, I actually end up keeping them on a little bit of beta blocker and ACE inhibitor as they need to, to hopefully help keep away a reoccurrence of this. So our girl here, SS, she had a balloon pump. She stayed in the CCU for five days. She got the right medications, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and diuretics, and she went home. Uh, interestingly enough, she returned to Grant three weeks later for syncope. They were worried about arrhythmia. Her repeat echo showed that her EF had normalized completely. Her ejection fraction was normal and the Takusobas had gone away. And the reason she passed out is probably because she was on diuretics that she didn't need anymore. So, so for me, this is actually a really neat case where uh, she was sick on a balloon pump. Three weeks later, she walked, she comes in and her heart function is completely normal. Um, so we talked about, once again, this acute heart failure and then chronic heart failure. Uh, the biggest exacerbations of chronic heart failure can be too much salt. Uh, it can be this acute illness where you have a fever, you have high blood pressure, hypertensive crisis. Classical one I see is noncompliance with meds as well as the sodium. Uh, and then you can even take other medications that may inhibit cardiac function, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, antibiotics or new cardiac medications, or then anything that is new or different. Here's your acute on chronic heart failure. They tend to get more fatigued. Uh, they have shorter breath. Uh, they kind of already have chronic swelling uh, and it can be a little bit worse. Uh, but, but really this is, uh, it, when you see this kind of thick brawny skin, they tend to have chronic lower extremity edema. So you can assume that they do have some chronic heart failure. Uh, with heart failure, you usually do have shortness of breath. Uh, you can have another symptom called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, where you feel abruptly shorter breath while laying flat. You have to sit up to feel better, which is also suggestive of orthopnea, where you once again are shorter breath while lying down. They're breathing faster, excuse me, faster. There's an increased work of breathing. And then classically, if these people are intubated, they get that pink frothy sputum. <laughs> Obviously, they're in some respiratory distress. They can have crackles. Uh, they may have a gallop when you listen to their heart from, a, from if they have LV dysfunction, they get an S3 gallop. Irregular pulse could be related to atrial fibrillation if that's new uh, in, in their presentation. Uh, so this laterally displaced point of maximal impulse. So whenever you're putting EKG leads on, you feel someone's chest wall. If you feel their heartbeat more out towards the apex, that may be a sign that they have heart enlargement and they've had prior heart attacks or prior heart failure. And then we talked about increased jugular venous pulsation is reflective of increased right-sided filling pressures. So here's kind of your classic uh, physical examination for someone with heart failure. They don't feel well, they're restless, they're breathing, uh, uh, their heart rate is fast, they can't lay flat to breathe, uh, they may be a little dusky, they have this uh, pink-tinged uh, frothy sputum, they have crackles, they're just not happy. So here's a classic picture of increased jugular venous pulsation. So here's your uh, jugular vein, you push on their belly, they get a little distension, that is generally, here's your inferior vena cava. When you push on their belly, you're increasing pressure here. And if this side is volume overloaded, it may push up over here to cause this distension in the superior vena cava, which is right here, that then goes up to your jugular vein. And that is all reflective of a backup of the left pump, but it also could be reflective of any sort of pulmonary artery issue. 
or even any lung disease. So take that one with a grain of salt. This guy's had open heart surgery there, if you can't tell. So this is where we talked about if you have this jugular venous distension, you think about heart failure, pulmonary embolus, or a COPD exacerbation. So this is a chest x-ray to talk about this lateral point of maximal impulse. So this is someone who has not had previous cardiac disease. You put your hand over their left chest wall, you're gonna feel their heartbeat right under your palm. But when they've had prior heart failure or a big baggy heart, you put your hand over here, you're actually gonna feel the, the, the heartbeat or the pulse out here more laterally. So that's how sometimes physical examination can give you some different clues as to what's going on. So the big question is heart versus lungs versus who knows what. A lot of times, most of these medical problems coexist. They're both gonna look like they're working hard with increased sympathetic tone. They both may have lower extremity edema. You can have cardiac wheezing, you can have pulmonary wheezing. They both may be hypoxic or have respiratory distress. Uh, EKG may help if they have arrhythmia or a STEMI, um, but this is hard to tell the difference. So when we talk about treatment out in the field, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. So some requirements, they have to be awake and conscious. Uh, they can't be throwing up. They can't have facial trauma and you can't have a pneumothorax. What basically positive pressure ventilation helps is that it distends alveoli, preventing collapse at the end of expiration, kind of pushes out the heart failure fluid from their lungs. Uh, you increase their surface area for gas exchange. It reduces the work of breathing. Uh, it's been shown to really reduce hospitalizations, reduce complication, but there is no difference in living and dying. And everyone always asks, should we give Lasix? So when you give loop diuretics like furosemide or Lasix, there actually are some concerns where it can have an early vasoconstrictive effect, meaning it's gonna raise the afterload and make the heart work a little harder. Uh, there's been studies where it shows that pre-hospital Lasix has actually been shown to increase mortality. Pre-hospital heart failure oftentimes is COPD, pneumonia, or sepsis. And when you do this, 40% of the patients who actually receive Lasix are the sepsis and pneumonia patients, and they actually needed fluids for sepsis or pneumonia. So if anything, you made them worse by giving Lasix. So that's why we're kind of steering away from Lasix in the field until you get them in and you can get a better assessment. Uh, morphine used to be a staple. Back in the day, used to do the whole Mona deal. Well now, so we know morphine does venodilate, it reduces anxiety. However, there is a registry where there are, there's some data that shows that it actually increases ICU admission compared to no morphine. So three times higher likelihood for ICU admission. There's a higher intubation rate. And probably more importantly, there is increased mortality uh, when you're giving morphine compared to not giving morphine. And this is all felt to be related to the depression of the respiratory center and the drive to breathe. And it can also cause hypotension. So nitroglycerin, it can help with afterload reduction. Uh, it can lower your blood pressure, which gives you better forward flow. And also when it's even low dose, it can help you with phenodilatation and it can actually help preload reduce you. So it actually helps shunt blood out to the periphery. If you use sublingual nitroglycerin, you don't even necessarily need to give a drip. But if you give 0.4 micrograms, excuse me, 0.4 milligrams sublingually, you actually are giving someone the equivalent of 60 to 80 mics of, uh, per minute of a nitroglycerin drip. So that's going to help their cardiac function and it'll help shunt blood out of their pulmonary circulation, helping people to oxygenate better. Here is this intraortic balloon pump that I talked about that I put in my patient here with Takusobas. So basically this goes in through the groin. It's an eight French hole, which is approximately two and a half millimeters. It goes in and basically at times with the heart beat. So when the heart squeezes, this balloon uh, comes down or it, uh, it doesn't expand, it contracts and that's felt to create a little suction, and that can actually help reduce afterload and bring more blood forward. Uh, it, it provides about half a liter of uh, benefit from cardiac output, and then when the heart is relaxing or in diastole, the balloon actually inflates, and it pushes blood backwards, and during diastole, it can actually improve coronary perfusion. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so this used to be a staple, uh, whenever anyone was sick or cardiogenic shock, they all got balloon pumps uh, because it did help coronary perfusion and help the heart to rest. Uh, now, through technology, we've got better toys. So one in particular, this is a surgical LVAD. This is kind of out of my wheelhouse. Uh, this is something that's done at Ohio State and even Riverside. 
uh, but this is where it's a surgical uh, left ventricular assist device. However, here in the cath lab, we've got this percutaneous LVAD, the one that we use most commonly is called an impella. So here's a picture of the impella. Uh, we can put them into the groin. We actually uh, here at Grant have put them in through the arm artery. And basically it's a catheter that goes in, sucks blood out through a little motor and then shoots blood out into the ascending aorta. This can offload the heart when people are really sick in cardiogenic shock. It can provide up to two and a half liters of blood flow. Uh, and this has really helped us uh, in some cases, we even use it for high risk coronary intervention. So this is just something, uh, there actually are no randomized studies saying that Impella is necessarily better than balloon pump. A lot of the data is kind of retrospective. Uh, there are some registries that have said that Impella uh, may actually be harmful if used in the wrong patient. So I still think that there's some more randomized data that needs to come out. So uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up. So in review, uh, heart failure is the number one cause for hospitalization for uh, Medicare patients in the United States. It's a very complex physiologic feedback loop. Usually it is due to inefficient pump function, either squeezing or relaxation. Uh, there's all different sorts of uh, heart failure. There's different sorts of etiologies, uh, some careful history and a physical examination can help differentiate as to what's going on. And most importantly, uh, in the field, you wanna treat hypoxia, you wanna treat blood pressure, and you wanna try to help treat their rhythm. And here's our lovely building at Grant. Uh, I think that's, that is all I have. Um, and what I'm actually gonna do real quick, if I can, I'm going to, actually, never mind. I think I'm done. <laughs>